Hi, everybody. It's great to see such a fabulous crowd. Um, you get to loosen your ties if you're buttoned up because it's warm in here tonight. I'm Virginia Mecklenburg, one of the senior curators here at SAM. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Clarice Smith Distinguished Artist Lecture for 2007. Each fall, through the generous support of Clarice Smith, the Smithsonian American Art Museum presents three distinguished lectures, one by a noted scholar, one by an eminent critic, and one by an artist whose work challenges, um, energizes, and in the case of Jim Rosenquist, might amuse us as well. Yeah. <laughs> that was him. <laughs> 1962 was a great year for Jim Rosenquist. He had his first solo exhibition at Green Gallery in New York, and he was featured in a show called The International Exhibition of New Realists at Sidney Janice's Elegant Gallery on 57th Street. In retrospect, it seems appropriate that the New Realists show opened on Halloween night. Instead of active surfaces and intense brushstrokes of the abstract expressionist canvases, that Janice usually showed he was the leading dealer for most of the abstract expressionists. People who came on opening night saw a comic strip picture of a fighter plane by Roy Lichtenstein, a lawnmower, one of the old push lawnmowers that Jim Dine put on a pedestal in front of a half-finished canvas, and an oversized painting showing the grill of an automobile hovering over a field of Franco-American spaghetti by Jim Rosenquist, who gave it the intriguing title I love you with my Ford. <laughs> so much for Mark Rothko's ideas about art being tragic and timeless. Jim's work is provocative and sometimes enigmatic. Irony and humor and beauty are all characteristics. Sometimes he does flowers, women's faces, but in all there are unexpected relationships among things that demand that we reevaluate re re what we see and think and know. Well, Jim is a busy man, so we are especially pleased that he could be here tonight. He has had one-man exhibitions, actually usually three or four, almost every year since the New Realist show in the early 1960s, and major museum exhibitions in New York, Washington, Stockholm, Cologne, Amsterdam, London, Bilbao, Berlin. If you have a list of the world capitals, um, we could go on and on. Some of you who are longtime friends will remember the retrospective that we did here in 1987. More recently, the Guggenheim Museum organized a 40-year retrospective that was one of the most exciting shows to hit the international circuit for 20 years, and coincidentally, provided the opportunity for Sam to acquire the painting Industrial Cottage, a magnificent 1977 canvas that you may have seen, and if not, I recommend you go see, it's hanging on the third floor of the galleries. A couple of housekeeping notes. Please turn off cell phones, blackberries, all those little things that beep in the night. We are webcasting tonight's program, so please be sure to use a microphone. Oh, I hear, I hear those little sounds from, from cell phones. Please, to be sure, please be sure to use a microphone if you have comments or questions at the end of Jim's talk. Um, and then I hope you'll join us afterwards in our new, brand new, beautiful Kogod Courtyard for a reception. And now it's a privilege to present Jim Rosenquist, who tells us that fine art is not a career. Good evening. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Oh, you could. <laughs> well, uh, thank, I want to thank Clarice Smith for having me, and she's sitting right there. In the front row. Betsy Barron and uh, Nina Martin, who's been showing me around here <coughs> today, because I haven't been here much since <coughs> I had an appointment from Jimmy Carter to serve on the Consul for the National Endowment for the Arts, and I was surprised to find 
We had so few friends of the arts in Washington, but we did have friends. And uh, Claiborne Pell, John Bradamus, uh, 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 Senator Javits, Livingston Biddle, and others. And they were wonderful. Sid Yates, wonderful, wonderful people. It was a learning experience for me. <clears throat> uh, I was asked about the title of my talk. And so I said, fine art is not a career. Why? Because you may be such an artistic genius that no one might buy your work until 15 years after you're gone. <laughs> Look at Vincent van Gogh. Artists have a reputation of appearing, working like hell, giving it all away and disappearing. You, that goes on and on. <clears throat> when I arrived in New York in 1955 with a scholarship to the Art Students League, I had letters of introduction from my teacher, Cameron Booth, <clears throat> a World War I veteran. He was older than a year, and he was gassed in w World War I. And, uh, but he, alas, he was broadsided in his Lincoln when he was 92, so he lived quite a time. When I arrived in New York, Cameron gave me letters of introduction to maybe a dozen very, very nice people who uh, were artists. And they did commercial art to make a living, and they lived, they lived uh, very well. I used to go to parties with George Gross, and I'd say, George. I mean, I didn't have a, partly a penny in my pocket. I was a, literally a starving artist then. And he used to take me so I could get something to eat. <laughs> Places, I said, George, this is re this place on Sutton Place, this is beautiful apartment. He goes, yeah, it costs $350 a month. <laughs> then we go to another penthouse apartment near Columbus Circle. I said, George, this beautiful, how much is, oh! Very expensive. It's 400 a month. So it blew, it blew me away because uh, later on I had a five room apartment on the Upper East Side for 31 bucks a month. <laughs> so that five, and the cops at that time, for the, the terrible temper of the times, the cops were making 85 bucks a week and striking for their 100 a week. My mother and father were aviators in 1931 at the Grand Forks, North Dakota Airport. My uncle Hedberg had been in the Army Air Corps from 29 to 32, and uh, he got out of, the, out of the Army Air Corps, and he and my father were going to start an international airline. What the, was that? Merely a mail route from Grand Forks to Winnipeg. <laughs> but <laughs> poor, poor Albert, who I was named after, uh, crashed flying a senator somewhere in a rainstorm. The Depression came into the Midwest. That was the end of uh, my parents' flying career. But my father <coughs> remained in aviation as an A&E inspector until he died. He, he inspected bombers in W-2 and, and so on. Uh, I was an only child and, uh, and living through the latter part of the Depression, the beginning of W-2 was a helter-skelter experience. <clears throat> I missed a lot of school. I think, I think this pertains to my career. <laughs> but I missed a lot of school, and I entertained myself by drawing in hotel rooms. We finally settled in Minnesota, and my mother said, you're always drawing. Maybe you can get a job doing something like that. So I saw an ad in the paper, wanted artist sign painter. I met a guy, W.G. Fisher, who Wore, he still wore his old army clothes he, and uh, got a job for $1.60 an hour painting Phillips 66 emblems in North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. His crew was rough. They were jail, jail, out of the jailbirds. I was a teenager. They were 29, so they didn't beat me up, but they kept buying me a lot of drinks. I had a hard time drinking. <laughs> I mean, it, and it was... Very strange experience because the uh, people who've been in jail are very peculiar people. <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, although I, I don't want to get into that too much. <laughs> After this job experience, I uh, 
I met Cameron Booth, and he was an amazing draftsman and colorist. And in, in his class, I would draw about eight charcoal portraits a day. I, I was born, I think, with the ability to draw, but Cameron Booth's emphasis was, how do you make a picture? How do you make a plastic picture after the golden mean rectangle, after cubism, after, how do you make an exciting picture out of a simple piece of rectangular canvas? And that's what I was interested in. So he told me, Minneapolis, there's nothing for you in Minneapolis. Go study with Hans Hoffman, his teacher, that he studied with in Munich. Uh, Hans left New York for Provincetown, so I sent my drawings to the Art Students League, and I won an out-of-town out scholarship in 1955 for one year. I was fortunate I studied with George Gross, Edwin Dickinson, Robert Beverly Hill, Hale, and Morris Cantor. They were all amazing people. Um, Edwin Dickinson is a little fellow with granny glasses, and he said, the reason why artists have such difficulty drawing and painting in Manhattan is that Manhattan isn't situated exactly north and south, and the light coming in the window throws them off. <laughs> He was great. He was absolutely great. I, after the Art Students League, I, was, I went to the welfare ward of the Roosevelt Hospital with pneumonia and got out of there in two weeks. And my friend Ray Donarski said, I know a great job. He said, there's these people who are very wealthy. You can live there, drive, be a chauffeur, a bartender. Let's go try and see what, what it is. So we go up to to Irvington on the Hudson in Westchester, and it was <clears throat> Roland Stearns, whose father started Bear Stearns Stock Brokerage. And Roland, I like Roland because he wasn't a spoiled brat. He enlisted in the Navy, saw action in the South Pacific, and uh, uh, I lived in luxury there. Didn't make much money, but uh, uh, it was a very, very beautiful place to live, but it wasn't my place. I had to get out of there. And uh, because I thought, it's not my house. <clears throat> so anyway, I left the Stearns and I transferred into the International Sign and Pictorial Painters Union Local 230, which turned out to be a, some experience. I was a union painter in a labor union painting pictures of movie stars, whiskey bottles, cigarettes, everything imaginable and good enough to sell a product. It had, otherwise I'd get fired. I worked along, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I spilled, <laughs> I spilled, well in one day I was in the middle of Times Square starting the Astor Victoria Theater which was 395 feet wide. The, the uh, Castro convertible sign on 47th Street and another sign. And a guy came up to me and said, what are you doing? He was from the United Press. I said, man, these are snake oil advertisements, man. But I'm really an artist. I paint little abstractions and I'm trying to save money to make them bigger. So he, <laughs> so he wrote an article, Billboard Michelangelo. Bill's paint on tourists far below. <laughs> uh, I had a lot of strange experience. I worked alongside New York communists from the 30s, you know, the old, the old boys, and my, <clears throat> my fellow workers. So I go to my first union meeting, and they're sitting in the corner, and I go, hey, Jimmy! Come over here, have a beer with us. Hey, come on. Oh, so I go have a beer with them. It was Gus and Harry. And, uh, <laughs> and I get up to go to the toilet, and the head of the union comes out, Italian, he's a little guy, John Scotty. And he says, James, see that side of the room over there? He says, yeah. He says, it's all red. You get a little red on you, it don't wipe off. I says, John. These are my fellow workers, he says. I told you. Only once, that's all. 
that was, you know, that's during the McCarthy, McCarthy era. Anyhow, I mean, working at Times Square was class, I mean, it was a nice place to work. <laughs> the Astor Hotel was still there where Frank Sinatra would come in. Uh, I learned a lot of tips from old painters and uh, uh, they, they, they'd say, hey kid, I'll show you something. So I'd say, okay, and they'd show me something. Oh, they'd say that to other young guys and they'd say, I know it already, get out of here. You know, they'd never show them anything again. Uh, in 1959, two guys got killed falling off signs. A.B. Marco fell off client department store and another guy fell off a Budweiser sign in New Jersey. So I asked for a large raise of 30 bucks a week and I quit. <laughs> uh, I had met artists along living in New York and Ellsworth Kelly told me about a studio in Coenty Slip for 45 bucks a month. I didn't fix it up. I moved in and I started thinking about what could I do? And I thought I could devise a paint, painting where fragments of generic images I would paint so large that the largest would be identified last. Yet the space would fall forward out of the picture plane instead of receding out an aperture as it has done for centuries. And even in the Louvre with the great paintings, they're all, you're looking out an aperture. My images were falling in your face. It was so I thought I was doing something new. So therefore I thought I could make a mysterious painting. There was no such thing as pop art then, anything like that. Well, one other billboard thing. <laughs> in Brooklyn, I was working for General Outdoor Advertising and the boss said, James, I want you to paint the Shenley whiskey bottle two stories tall on top of a candy store. So I painted it. Next day, he says, two days later, he says, James, there's another one. I, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. I wound up painting over 140 lousy Shenley whiskey bottles. <laughs> so on the label, I, got the, I knew how to paint them pretty well by then. So on, the, on the label, it said, this spirit is made from the finest grains and so on. Instead, after a while, I wrote, Mary had a little lamb as fleece as white as snow. So you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't tell, I was just going bananas, so you couldn't tell from the street what that was, except when the workers would take the pick, sign down, they go, we're going to lose our jobs. We're losing, this kid is going to make us lose our jobs. Anyway. <laughs> so that made me think about advertising, and, uh, which is integral to the capitalist system, uh, but it's, it's my, my experience really was painting all this commercial art is really, I was involved with the color and the texture of these enlarged things I was painting and not really, not really the commercial side of it. I moved into this loft and I started painting and I never solicited my work ever. One day, it was down, down by Wall Street, the Coenty Slip right by the battery. Uh, one day I looked out the window and there was Dick Bellamy, Henry Geltzeller, and Ivan Karp sitting on the curb smoking cigars. Bellamy had a gallery on 57th Street. Henry was at, he was head of the 20th century wing of the Metropolitan Museum, and Ivan Karp worked for Leo Castelli. After a while, there was a knock on the door they came in, Dick Bellamy looked around and said, ah, there's something finally I can show in my new gallery. And he asked uh, if I would like to be in his gallery and then Carp says, don't sign any papers. <laughs> Henry danced around in the studio looking at everything. Dick started bringing people down to my studio, Robert Skull, the Tremaines and others. Leo Castelli came down with Count Panza. Panza bought three paintings even though Leo wasn't my dealer. By the time my show opened in February 62, it was sold out. The prices ranged from $350 to $1,100 a picture. I was happy and I felt lucky. And <clears throat> my next show was at the Museum of Modern Art that Dorothy, called Dorothy, it was Dorothy Miller's 16 American show in 1963. Uh, 
One of, <laughs> one of these paintings in my first show I sold for 450 bucks. It was sold, auctioned off last week for a million and a half. <laughs> my next show in 64 was a sellout. Dick, Dick Bellamy had personal and financial problems and kept telling me he was planning to close the gallery. It wasn't it was not financial, but it was his own personal problems. On a plane somewhere, sitting next to Leo Castelli, Leo said, Jim, if you ever think of leaving Dick, please consider me first. At the end of 64, I joined Leo's gallery, and my first show with Leo was with Leo's ex-wife, Ileana Sanabin, in Paris. I thought they were in collaboration, but I really didn't know. I even thought maybe I was paying his alimony or something. <laughs> And that's not nice. Yeah, 1965, I had my first show with Leo at 4 East 77th Street and showed a wraparound painting called F111 that sold for about 50,000 bucks. And a few years ago, it was resold to the Museum of Modern Art for about five million. Uh, Paris was, in 64, was very interesting because, why? Because so many great artists were still alive. Picasso, Miro, Giacometti. They came to my, they came, to Giacometti, Miro, Polyakov came to my, I didn't get to meet them, but they came to my show and they were around. It was amazing that they were alive. And, and at my opening, Edouard Jaguer claimed I was a surrealist. He was inviting me to the Café Venus as a surrealist. And Pierre Alashinsky, you probably know his work, he said, no, I was a Russian realist. <laughs> and little, little Pierre knocked, Edward, big guy, knocked him right in the jaw, knocked him on the floor, and I thought, wow, this Paris is incredible. They hit somebody for an aesthetic reason over there. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> Crazy. And I heard that Giacometti saw my work he said to Ileana, it's not painting. It's not, it may be some kind of poetry, but it's not painting. It was good enough for me. The reason, the reason I did F1, F111 painting was a wraparound painting in the whole, covered all the walls. The ideas were ideas from peripheral vision to paying income taxes for war weapons that seemed to be obsolete before being used, which kept middle-class America employed. Later on, it was highly criticized and written about as an anti-Vietnam picture. At the time, I was 32 years old, and I had my first retrospective show, the National Gallery of Canada, organized by Bryden Smith. They bought two works then. I stayed with Leo Castelli, for over 30 years until he died. Mm -hmm. And I had many shows with him practically every, more than one every year, in different places. I want to tell you about some art collector experiences I had because an art collector comes along, you don't know them, they don't know you, they want to buy something of you, some piece of you, some kind of thing, and it's a very awkward a lot of times. So when I was on Coenty Slip, I lived in a big one-room loft, and my dear Dick called and said, <clears throat> James, the, the mayors are here from Chicago, and they want to buy a painting. I said, Dick, I got pneumonia or something. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I might be laying on the couch. I'll leave the door, I'll hang a painting on the wall and I'll leave the door open. You can open the door, look at the painting, and, but I won't be able to receive you really. They just, he says, okay, I'll try that. Two hours later, there's a knock on the door. Just then, a big wharf rat as big as a little kitty sticks his head up right in the middle of the floor. And they're very silent. You know, they don't make any sound. I'm laying on the couch, there's a rat. <laughs> they open up the door. They see me, they see the rat, they see the painting, and they slam the door and say, we'll take it. And they slam the door. <laughs> Not even think the rat, they took my painting. 
then in, uh, at Leo's, Leo's gallery, uh, I showed this wraparound painting called Horse Blinders, <clears throat> covered all the walls. And Dr. Ludwig from Cologne came in nine o'clock in the morning and says, Ach, so gun shona, I must have this. How much is this? And there was only one wall up at the time. And so uh, I says to Leo, look, tell him to come back tomorrow and maybe we can give them a figure out of price. So Dick says, well, your F-111 painting was 50 grand. Let's ask 70 grand. So he came back right away next morning. He says, yeah, what is the cost here for this painting? And Leo said, $70,000. He says, phooey. <laughs> Just then the phone rang. And I think it was Philip Johnson. And he was interested in buying it. I, here I am with this guy. I don't know him from anywhere. And I said, you know, doctor, our secretary of the interior, Walter Hickel, just sold our offshore oil rights in California for $70 million. And they had some, I didn't know what I was saying. And they had some <laughs> ducks covered with oil out there, with oil spills. I said, you can't make a duck with $70 million. Leo came back. He was right on the button. He says, yes, doctor, we are the ducks. <laughs> so then when he heard Philip was interested, he would put his auction sign down. It's mine. Yep. Yeah. It's mine. So he bought it. And it's now in the Ludwig collection in Cologne. Among the early co art collectors were the Robert Skull, who owned about 120 taxi cabs, the Emily and Burton Tremaine, Philip Johnson, Richard Brown Baker, and Jan Streep, who I just found out was Meryl Streep's uncle, which is a curiosity. He's dead now. He's, he's, long, he's been dead a long time. The art world was very small in the 1960s. There were very few avant-garde galleries. The Leo Castelli, Sidney Janis, Betty Parsons, and the Stable Gallery, and they were about the best, I think. Leo's, Castelli's mission was to get paintings to quality collectors and people at a low price. And he would, if someone offered him a price for something and someone who, like Philip Johnson or someone else, wanted it, he'd, he'd give it to the, the other, the biggest, the bigger collector. The, the biggest and best for an abstract painting <clears throat> in 1960 was about seventeen to twenty thousand dollars, including a David Smith sculpture, uh, Rothko, de Kooning, and so on. And at the French and Company galleries, overnight. They raised the prices to 35,000. They doubled them to about 35,000. I remember having dinner with David Smith in Chinatown, and he said a church group came in to buy, wanted to buy a big sculpture, and they said, how much is it? And he says, $36,000. So he said they went into a huddle and came out, and they said, our congregation has been saving its pennies. Would you take 34000 He says, I think that would be all right <laughs> because it had just changed overnight to that price. Nineteen seventy one, my family suffered a terrible auto crash in Tampa, Florida, and I was, I was in mid-career, but $60,000 in debt because I had a bad named insurance policy. <clears throat> I was asked by Don Saff, the University of South Florida's graphic studio to make prints. Don is sitting right there. He lives in this neck of the woods now. He was very, very helpful. I was in a deep blue depression, and uh, he said, why don't you come here, do something, get to work. Get to work, get over your worries. And I did, and I was, I did a portfolio of prints that time, and I managed to uh, to sell them to a, an art dealer and slowly get out of, out of a prob, prob, financial, financial problem. 
I decided to move to Florida. I borrowed money from Marion Goodman, Leo Castelli, and Sid Felson, and managed to buy property in the Gulf of Mexico and build a house. Later, I built two airplane hangar style buildings with 90 skylights. In that spa large space, I painted large commissions for the Guggenheim Deutsche Bank Museum, Singapore, and then Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum, Bilbao, Spain. As you heard, I've had a lot of retrospective <coughs> venues. Moscow, Spain twice, right here in 87, to Whitney in 72 and 85, and the last one was the Guggenheim at the Menil in uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Guggenheim, New York, and then Bilbao and in Germany. I'm getting older, and my life seems to be getting bit. I've never been so busy. And I'm lucky because many of my fellow artists are gone. I can't call them up for a rabbit skin glue recipe. I'm very happy to be here and have to see you. And I'm going to show some of my works that I did quickly. And then I'll answer. If you had a, a question about anything, I'll try to answer it because I've been asked just about everything. <laughs> This, this, this is a little painting called, I love it, it's called, Hey, Let's Go for a Ride. Uh, I did it about 40. Oh, what's that, dear? Can you hear you? Hello. Hello. It's up to those guys yeah, up there. Thank you. Um, I did it about 45 years ago. That's the Ford Spaghetti picture. It's now in the uh, Modern Museum in Stockholm. This is a painting, it's in the Hirshhorn Museum. The Light That Won't Fail, number one, I think. It's called Marilyn Monroe. I never, I saw her twice, but I never met her. This is called Air Hammer. <clears throat> where the impact is, the windows are rolled down so there's no impact. It's called Four Young Revolutionary Guys. This is called Capillary Action Number One, I think. There's canvases sticking out from the picture plane, painted the same color as the background. This is, called, this is about 24 feet long. It's called A Lot to Like. <coughs> this is called a Vestigial Appendage. This is the painting that was on the wall when they, people slammed the door. <laughs> and now I sold it for 450 bucks, and it's now in the Julio Gonzalez Museum in Valencia. This is called toaster, and the metaphor for the toaster is the two circle saw blades, which is supposed to be the toast. It's a tough morning. <laughs> this is called Lenai. It was owned by John, the late John Powers. It still, it still is owned by him. This is called conveyor belt, and it's all about nothing. It's called Two 1959 People. It's in the Rose Museum in Brant. This is called Tumbleweeds, Chrome-Plated Barbed Wire Tumbleweed. This is part of F-111, one, one wall. There I, <laughs> there I am as a young boy, <laughs> sitting in the corner. You can see the scale of the painting. Here I am, this is uh, called, the painting called Flamingo Capsule, being started, which is now owned by the, the Basque government, I believe, in uh, Bilbao, I think, I believe they own that. This is an experiment of uh, blended colored panels 
I think in 1970 sometime, and this is a photograph by Claude Picasso. And Claude Picasso was an, really an aspiring uh, photographer. I met him with Gianfranco Gorgoni then, and uh, then when Picasso died, he really became totally involved with the Fondation Picasso, and I, and, uh, I think he stopped taking pictures. This is called Terrarium. It's, a, it's after a Zen Cohen. This is the painting that's here. It's a little bleached out in this picture. A little more vivid than that. And the inspiration for doing this, I was driving around Florida. I saw a chain link fence around a cemetery. And on the chain link fence, there was a sign that says, Mobile Home for for rent. <laughs> this is the life-size top of a car that's supposed to be the ruby in her engagement ring, and she's promised all these dirty dishes in the future. <laughs> this is called the Glass Wishes. This is Star Thief. He is 17 by 46 foot painting that's now in the uh, Ludwig Museum in Cologne. This is a small painting called Chambers Street. Chambers. Because on one end of Chambers was the law, and I was the only, I was the door at the other end of Chambers Street, an artist. I was the doorknob on the other end. This is called Dog Descending a Staircase. <laughs> the male image is the dog, the female image is the, is the little baby doll, and his business is this steel milling company. This is a, an abstract <clears throat> flower painting that was uh, bought by uh, Henry Racquemier at Louis Vuitton long, many years ago. In the 80s. This is a 17 by 46 foot painting called Through the Eye of the Needle to the Anvil. This is a painting called, <laughs> called The Masquerade of the Military Industrial Complex, Complex Looking Down on the Insect World. And what got me going about this was, the, remember, the Russians had a bunch of astronauts up in space while the whole Russian government was going in total turmoil. And I think the astronauts wondered if they were going to come back to Earth, <laughs> if they even had the money to bring them back. Anyway, that, that was part of the idea about this, this painting. This is called Where the Water Goes. It's about ecology. It's the sink with stuff in a sink. And uh, the idea that you throw, for a young boy or girl, that you throw something away isn't really true. You just move it somewhere else. This is going from left to right. This is um, uh, a huge picture I did for the, for the Deutsche Bank in Berlin, Guggenheim. And it's um, called The Swimmer in the Econo dash mist. That this was three paintings. This is the small end painting. And there's this is another forty foot painting, part of the triptych. This is called The Meteor Hits the Swimmer's Pillow. Why I did this, because <clears throat> in 1938, I was living in Atwater, Minnesota, and a fat lady about 15 miles north of Atwater 
got hit, a meteorite came through the roof of her house, smashed through, hit her on the hip, and went through the floor, but it didn't kill her. And I thought about this all for years and years and years, and I thought, did I dream this? Or did, was this really happen? Lo and behold, my dentist in Florida pulled up a picture of her fat hip on, the, on his, uh, on his, uh, it is computer. I couldn't, anyway. <laughs> Here's another abstract painting. This is called, um, the um, stowaway peers out at the speed of light. And the reason I, I did a number of speed of light pictures, this is not one of them. This is another one, 17 by 46, called Joy. The speed of light pictures, when Einstein said that the spectator and the traveler is looking at the same thing, see it, sees it differently, it appears different, it misshapen and misshapen or changed. I, when I would have a show of paintings, I was always surprised as who liked what. I thought some of the smarter collectors turned out to be kind of dumb, and then some of the, I thought people who didn't know anything really could see things. So it was always who liked what was always very peculiar. That's, so I thought what you see is not what you get. What you're getting is all my, the archaeology of my experience under, in the underpainting. And this is finally what you see. That's in the speed of light pictures. There's another small painting. This painting, paint, this painting is called The Xenophobic Movie Director or Our Foreign Policy. <laughs> and in the light bulb, in Arabic, it says, Il Hamidu Leleha Ala Khamin. And that's being knocked out of the rough of numbers by a golfer. And that means, what I just said means, praise God, the creator of our worlds. Another abstract painting. <clears throat> another one. And another one. Here's a painting I did for Ferrari. I'm friends with the crew chief, John Tott, the Formula One crew chief. So he asked me to do picture for him. It has a, in the center of it, there's a little, there's a acrylic rod, maybe a foot long, and then the, in the back of the painting is a little checkerboard flag, and that pops right to the front of the piece of acrylic rod, like a fiber optic, because all the race car drivers told me that they look way off in the distance to whip because they're going to be there in the next second or, or sooner. Here's a painting in my current show called The Hole in the Center of the Clock. Here's a small painting called Idea 2.50 AM, I think it is called. And here's a little sculpture. I drilled holes in a light bulb, put a whiskey cork in the bottom with a little light and two pencils sticking it in, in the light. A little, little, little thing. Here's another time painting. I think it's called Zone. Here's another one called Time Blade. Steve Wynn in Las Vegas bought this painting. Here's another one. Um, way up in the top of the middle of the painting is a little small clock with, and it's laying down with, with laser, beam, laser beam 
hands. And the experiment is that when you extend the length of the, particularly the minute hand, and the little laser dot shows up at a distance, it moves very fast. If you stand near the clock, it takes one minute for that hand to go around. But when it's, if it's that little hand, arm of that clock was longer, a mile longer, two miles, it would be racing around in a circle. So it's, it's an idea about speed and space and being, being dislocated from, from, or in, well, it's hard to explain, but it's like um, in, in space, being in contact with the earth or not being in contact, does your life change? Is, is there a change in time? This is a 23-foot painting called Time Blades Learning Curves. That's it. It's enough. <laughs> Anybody have a question? Over there. I'd like to ask, if I may, about some about your adventures with materials. We have a group of uh, conservation students here tonight, and we'd like to know if you've had any adventures where the materials have changed so much that you've wanted to withdraw the painting from You mean art materials? Art materials. Or have our conservation colleagues treated you well? Have we behaved? Have we done anything such as varnish a work that shouldn't be varnished that you regret? Did anybody hear, anybody hear that one? Yeah. Well, anyway, okay, I had a lot of experience with that, which you're talking about. <clears throat> when I was painting billboard signs in Times Square, we had one job called the Regal Boot Sign. And it was green. And the men were asked to mix up this green powder in oil to put on his regal boots. And it was arsenic, and about eight of them died. <laughs> then poison. Uh, I worked with lead, white lead paint for years. I never ate it. I kept it off my hands. I didn't rub it on my body or anything. It's white, just plain white lead, which is poison. You know, it's not good. And I never got affected. I never got lead poisoning. However, some men did. Why? <clears throat> because they mixed the white lead, they mixed powder, they mixed it up in the powder, and they were breathing some of the powder. So the worst thing in art materials is dust or spray. I think it's car spray. Even watercolor spray, not good for you at all. And that's what's, that's what's trouble. There are paints, they're still not good for you, like the cadmiums. And there's a lot of laws, like the OSHA, OSHA law, laws, that want to prohibit anybody from using any material at all. My point is it should be not given to children, it should be given to professionals. They should know what they're doing. And that's, that's really the dilemma. Because some of the federal laws want to prohibit people from using anything. There was a, a varnish called Rhine's Varnish, Don knows about. Uh, it had, uh, what did it have? It had ether in it and some other material. People claimed it was very carcinogenic. So, it was made in England, and uh, so it was stopped. And it was a very good stuff. I mean, it was stuff we used all the time, but we were very careful not to eat it, breathe it, or anything. Lo and behold, <laughs> an Englishman started bootlegging it up in his attic. <laughs> and I, so you could still sneak it out of England. <laughs> so the, the two things is, uh, is that, I mean, are that... Um, uh, 
I think people should be told what's bad and what's dangerous and avoid it. I've seen young ladies, pretty girls, in boat factories in Florida, merely wearing a t-shirt, bare arms and a paper mask, spraying uh, fiberglass resin, which is terrible. That can kill you. I think that I've seen cases. I saw a wealthy woman who was totally crippled up because she was she couldn't help herself. She was making sculpture with bare hands and acrylic fiberglass resin. So that that certainly should be explained to uh, students. So uh, I've been painting now for I don't know 40, 50 years, and I don't have any poisons yet because I don't. I use a low volatile mineral spirit that doesn't evaporate quick and uh, I stay away from getting paint on my hands. That's it. Any other, any, did I answer your question? Yes, dear. I liked your anecdote about Edwin Dickinson, and I'm wondering what Robert Beverly Hale was like as a teacher. Okay, here's one. <laughs> and I studied with him. He's pretty old. But he could be married. The gal had a baby. He was in his 80s or something like that. So anyway, once he said, he said, uh, if you want to draw the equestrian, Ask a friend who owns a horse. <laughs> and you tell him that you won't hurt the horse by drawing him. <laughs> he, was, he, he, was, he was funny, funny guy. And Morris, I don't know, Morris Cantor, he had a limp. And he'd just walk in and go, What? What are you doing putting the yellow in that for? That's all I went, mean. what? I don't know. <laughs> and uh, George Gross, he, he, he was a very delicate draftsman. He'd say, uh, now here, now here, and he'd, and he'd, he'd give him your, your crayons or whatever. And he had a really a delicate touch. I mean, it was, he was an incredibly soft teacher. Anybody else? Yes? I just love the fact that you know the titles and the sizes of all of your paintings and when you painted them rather than going to a gallery and seeing untitled 450. Well, I'll tell you, I, I've, I've hired a, he's not here, he was supposed to be here, but he got sick. Michael Harrigan has been my uh, curator for I don't know how many years now, it's got to be over 10 years. And without him, I wouldn't have a career because I wouldn't know where my paintings are, where, where what, what they were, or anything. So he's like a detective, and he finds things. I traded pictures, paintings with Dennis Hopper in, in the 60s, and he gave his painting away in his divorce to, to uh, his wife. And then Michael found it on a... Austrian catalog somewhere. So <laughs> he, he, he he tracks things down and just for the, we like to know where they go, where they went, and it's it's curious. They, I think Marcel Duchamp said, "I do the best I can, and either an artwork has a life of its own or it doesn't." Karl Heinz Stockhausen, the composer, said. I want my music to be played mathematically after I'm de dead, so it's always the same. <laughs> well, then you have somebody like Yehudi Menuhin coming in and reinterpreting it. So anyway, there's a lot of different ideas. Anybody else? Yes, dear. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice to people who want to do fine arts as a career? 
<laughs> well, fine art, I mean, for, there's a lot of poop, hoopla in the art world now of people doing things and asking $20 million for them and this and that and that and this. And, um, <clears throat> and as you grow older, if you have money or not, don't have money, you'll find out, I think you'll find out that art is really a passion. It's not a money-making goal, which seems to be in the eyes of a lot of young people. I don't blame them because they probably don't have any money. I never, I started out with zero, nothing. But um, I think if you can find a situation where you can dream up something that no one else has ever, ever seen, as Roy Lichtenstein said, uh, invent your own game and be the star of it because no one else knows how to play it. <laughs> if, you do, if you could do that and you have time to gather steam and then when you have an exhibition or show your work, you'll knock them dead. And here's, what, here's the dilemma. Now it's so expensive in New York for a young artist that they scramble to have a show of their fine art as fast as they can. They try to put something together to pay the rent and then the critics say they stink. And they say, really? Are really that bad? Then they have to work twice as hard to show that they're not pretty good. Now that, that situation has stopped a few people. The tough one, tough people, they, it doesn't stop them. They keep on going. But it, so it's really, it really is a passion for doing something or doing something that you want to prove to yourself that you actually had the idea. That's what I do. I mean, I make paintings because I have these strange dreams or ideas, or ideas, and, and uh, so I make, put, make them something physically so I can relate to them later. It's, it's also an idea about conceptual art, too, where a con in conceptual art, your feelings rise according to how you feel. And you can't be high all the time, like in Satori, like in the Eastern idea of Satori. There's a, you have to try to work at it and maintain your awareness to, to do something that's like purely conceptual. However, if you do something physical, it's a thing or a painting or anything, you can come back and, and relate to it. And also that thing that you did might be a stepping stone to a better idea. But if you didn't do the thing, uh, you might just forget it. So I, that's what I mean. It's hard. It's always been difficult for a young artists, but I think it's really the, the passion that drives them along to do it. And uh, money now in the art world, it seems to be the, the, art, the art world is very liquid right now, I think. I don't know why I have some ideas, but there's a lot of money being spent. I'm lucky it's being spent on me. <laughs> I mean, that, that's not, not always been the case. But uh, my advice is to uh, get to be really good and then show your, <laughs> then surprise everybody. No, I have, I had two protégés now. Uh, the story, there, I, have a, I have a Korean nephew. He was adopted as a little boy, little baby. And then his mother and father threw him out of the house, really. And who came into place but his grandmother, my Aunt Ruth. And she said, James, would you take care of Jin Ho because he's, He's out on his own. So I said, well, bring him down to Florida. Well, he came down to Florida, nervous wreck. He goes, I got to leave. I got to see my girlfriend. I, gotta, I said, well, go. I don't care. You don't, Go. No, no, no. I better stay. I better stay. No, no, no. He stayed. We stretched up seven big canvases for him. You know? He started doing real corny, corny paintings. I said, don't do that. It's corny. Show me what you feel. Then out came the blood and the guts and everything else. Then it out came. We sent seven pictures back to his school. He won a year's free scholarship. 
right now, he's a success story. He has a French gallery. He's had shows recently in Berlin. I said, Jim, what's the most you ever sold a painting for? Now he says, $95,000. So he's now married. His wife is a few months pregnant. He's got nothing to do but work, <laughs> work, work. He's living in Paris and he's doing very well. He's financially cool. The other guy I'm trying to help is Star Wallowing Bull, an American Indian kid in Fargo, North Dakota. They gave me an honorary doctor degree out there and uh, they, they induced me to this kid. I said, how you doing? And I said, how you doing? He said, I said, what do you see? He says, I'm an artist. I said, oh, really? Said, I said, do you have a studio? Yeah, across the street. I go over there. That kid was like a baby Picasso. He was brilliant. He was doing, they looked like psychedelic war dances with strange figures and things. And I bought a little painting from him immediately. I said, look, you make 10 paintings. Don't show them to anybody but me. I'll make a selection. I'll get you a show in New York. Well, he's been slow about that. <laughs> he's been slow. Why? Because, why? Because... He sells his preliminary drawings for a couple of hundred bucks to some local people. I said, you could have stayed like that the rest of your life if you don't make a decision. So I haven't, he's having some troubles, I think. But Jin Ho is fantastic. He's fantastic, and his paintings are fantastic, too. So he's, he, has, he has nowhere to go but up. I just wanted to ask if you find yourself critiquing signs and billboards. I didn't get that, dear. What? I wanted to ask if you find yourself critiquing signs and billboards. No. No, because it's all photography. Everything's all photography. See, when I was doing that, it was all hand, <laughs> all hand painted which was a great experience. And it does, that doesn't exist for any youngster today. That's a lost school of something. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Some of your paintings look like they might have some airbrush. No airbrush. <laughs> Why? It's too fragile. The only airbrush I ever used was dots for stars a couple of times, but I tried doing a portrait with an airbrush, and you could just wipe it off with your hand. It's, it's, see, I want to do paintings. I've done paintings where a New York City fire hose has hit them and didn't knock the paint off them. <laughs> Seriously, there was a fire down below and a, the fire department stuck a hose through the floor and hit one of my paintings and poof, the paint still stayed there. <laughs> Anybody else? I, I just have a follow-up. One that. more and then that's it. Okay. Somebody in the back have... there? I was wondering how long it takes you to finish one of those big 17 by 40 something foot paintings? Oh, about 72 years and two months. <laughs> Thank you very much. us upstairs in the Kogod courtyard. We have a little refreshment and you'll have a chance to talk with Jim a little more. <laughs>